Kroiso, welcome. This is Ben Schwellen, and today I'm talking about the early Welsh kingdoms. It's a very murky context, but what we do know is what I'm going to shine light on for you in this video. From the 5th century, the western realms of Britain drop off the face of history for every purpose. We don't know much of what happened for 400 years. And then when we, as Welsh, come back into it and we have more written and more surviving evidence of what eventually happened, we find ourselves, by the end of that period, a new nation formed out of an older nation, and we're not sure what or who is in charge in that, in this place. And so because of that uncertainty, four new polities batter each other into form, and Wales really does become a nation of four main polities. And I'm going to take you through each one of those in this video, explain to you some brief bits of their history, how they formed, and the different cultural influences that make them different to each other. It's fitting that because the southeast was clearly the most Roman of these four emerging polities, that we have the clearest idea of what was happening. In the southeast, we get Roman charters, Roman-styled charters, and property is being passed down according to Roman terminology and traditions well into the 8th century. This is very different to much of the rest of Wales. And this kingdom of Gwent emerges out of the old Silures region, clearly. And you get places like Tindin, Llaneruk, early religious centers, Llanelldidvaur, kings in the north even came down to study there. In this region we have a book that survived, Llyfrlandar, and it was telling of the foundations of the kingdom of Gwent. It's very important, it's remarkable in what it gives us in terms of evidence. Now, it was a bit of political propaganda, and the area further west around Llandav. This was a minor kingdom in itself at one point, but it emerged as an ecclesiastical center, and many texts were written here. One odd thing about these texts which have survived is that the word Canadal, meaning a kind of a tribal familial nation at that point, is not found in them because of how Roman this is, and it really does put it apart from the other regions of Wales in that context. The terminology is much more Romano-British for a lot longer. The territory is not confined to what is presently Wales. You had Erging emerging across the forest of Dean, Quidwig Dena in Welsh. You had estates where local strongmen were building up across this fertile plain. Morganug to present-day Sirvanwe. Dinas Powys, this was an estate. And you had men called Breir, which is a compression of an older word, Brogorix. Brogorix, meaning king of an area. Bro, a small cultural vicinity. And Arix. Latin slash early Welsh. We get this in Gaulish as well, actually, that we know. These strong men emerged around families, aristocratic nobility, claiming small areas, and you get areas like Quinshug. Die. 
small administrative units. Over a long cycle, you had kings, mainly in Gwent, which was expanding, slowly taking them over. Gwent was clearly the strongest initially, but you had Kaliwissing as well. And in Gwent, you had the dynasty of Merig of Taudrig. And there are saints all speckled through this. Gwent occupied fertile land along the mouth of the river Gui. The consolidation of kingship and territory reached its peak when Ethel at Morgan ruled as sole king over the whole kingdom, which was quite rare for one king to go at it alone. That was an achievement of all the people you had to fight. And he did this from 715 to 745. That's quite a reign, if true. And his realm was known as Glywissing, so Gwent had expanded. After it felt minor kings rose up and broke it into bits and they had to hammer it back together again slowly into a climax when Morgan of Owain re-pushes it together. Morgan Han, Morgan the Old, and it's called in that time Morganug which is what Glamorgan in English takes its name from. And Gwent at that point had become a region of this kingdom. But after Morgan of Owen, it breaks up again on the verge of the Norman invasion. And so when the Normans arrive, the southeast is broken up into fighting fragments, and it does not bode well. A note on the southeast and the Saxons. You would expect them to be quite close and rubbing up against each other in quite a violent, but the Severn to the south of the Havren was quite the barrier. And to the north you had Brychenio, which, as I'll get to in a moment, was in another emerging kingdom stemmed from the southwest. And to the east you had the forest, a massive forest. And in these days, a forest of such size as Kortwigdana is not something you just marched an army through without thinking about it. And so Gwent was in a very defensible position to grow. The southwest gave the kingdom of Duved from the old Demetai tribe, and this may have been a collection of tribes, and there was an apparent and clear fusion with Irish coming in, in a way that's not quite the same way in anywhere else in Wales. And the language may have shifted to Irish at one point, and certainly dialects from the Priscelli going north in the Cerdigion of Welsh have a clear Irish influence in my opinion. Gildas mentions Gorthavir in the 6th century, and we have a memorial stone, it appears, to this man, which says, Memoria Votiporis Protectoris, in memory of the protector Votikorigas, and this word protector, it's, it is a Roman title, and the Latin is proliferate, it's everywhere. But also we have Ocam, the Irish writing, the, the lines, and there's over 20 stones found in this region with it on this. That's significant from this six, 5th century time, and Forticordigus is from this time. We see a kingdom of Dubad that's got Latin, clearly, using Roman titles with influence from Irish in Wales. We also get poetry. Edmig Dinbech came from this region, talking about the beauty of Dinbech Episcod. And we have a proliferation of religious context because of Tevewi which is the Holy See, St. David, is from these lands as well. But St. David became the patron saint of Wales. Why not from another region? Because this region was so rich and vibrant. A cult amassed around Dewi Sant, St. David, which spread to other parts of Wales. And there was a deep literate tradition here of these texts, which enabled it to spread Candela, further to the east in the southwest region, began to blossom another kingdom in Astradtoe. And another kingdom, Sichug, and Guir. These were all minor sub kingdoms. Sichug ruled quite an extent between Toe and Tevi. That's an important 
water weight to have held. And the king of Seishug would have been Seishig. And this is what gave the name in English Sicil, which came before that from Latin, meaning the sixth one. A lot of kids, I guess. Do that last more or less until Huwava emerges, one of the most important kings who codified or set down in writing our laws. He absorbed Duvet into this kingdom and they called it Dehebarth, the southern realm. But it wasn't really looked at as a kingdom as the others were. Duvet was always seen within it as being its own in some kind of an administrative capacity. We're not entirely sure. And earlier on, this Ostrad Toe bit, it connects down to Duvet through these old Roman roads. But going the other way, up into Brecheniol, emerged the kingdom of Brecheniol from Irish influence. And that carried with it the cult of Taylor up these Roman roads where that kingdom was founded. So this area is prosperous enough to expand and the cult of Taylor moves into the southeast even and takes over bits there, which caused them later on to be writing those books of Khandav. Competition between these two kingdoms is actually in the southwest and southeast. In the southwest and southeast is producing writing between them which enables us to know more of what was going on. And they share another thing that's important. They're very sheltered from Anglo-Saxon influence and invasion. But as we get to in the north and northeast, that was not the case. We move into a much more warlike polity. Duved was connected by sea, and we see a re-emergence of what was possibly an older link between Britain and Ireland in this kingdom. I have to note that is important in terms of it being culturally distinct from what was going on further east. The Northwest has a strange origin story about it. First, we have Max Noedig and his dream, Braithwood Max Noedig, falling in love with a woman and Sigontium, present day Canarvon, and a glimmering castle and taking us out of Rome and Wales being a nation in some sense born there and then us not knowing what happened next and suddenly the Irish have taken over that area but then a king or line of kings from Scotland somehow come down to this region be it by horse or sea, and retake Gwyneth, and then later claim descendants from Unus Manau, the Isle of Mam, and are echoing poetry from North England and Southern Scotland, whilst creating an origin story of eight sons. Eight sons who define the perimeter of their emerging polity by claiming lands upon it with their names. And what do I mean by all of this? Kineva. This was the name of this semi-mythical figure. We know that he existed, we think. But when he exactly came down and kicked the Irish out, it's a bit more hazy. Around the year 407, give or take. Kineva is linked to southern Scotland and the Isle of Mam. We have glimpses of him extending his power down to the south coast of Wales briefly. And his son Caredig gives the title to Caredigion, which becomes a kingdom for a while. And his son Rivon gives us Rivonyog. And his son Dinod, Dinoding and his son Dogvile, Dogvailing, and Edern, Edernion, and Merioni, there's not long after. We also get to Ganwe, this sea fortress here, which is across from Unasma on their base, but it's in a position covering this crucial seaway, and there's different ecclesiastical centers, one over on a Gogarth. 
and Moran and his mom. And it seems, there seems like there was something here before, but we're unable to know exactly. But that Avon Conway below De Ganway is, oh, if you want to connect to the south, it was navigable at that point seven miles inland. That's a strategic position to hold for military gain. And what I think's happening here is a very military organized feudal political structure emerges out of maybe even someone local just with ties to the north, the old north. They create this origin myth with their sons to proclaim right to rule over all the lands along their periphery. That's what it seems like to me. It's a, a propaganda story to entitle future expansive imperial ambition. It's quite clever and it works. The Irish here are kicked out, though they leave their names upon Sheen and ecclesiastical names like Clonog are quite echoing of Irish sounds, and you have Gwyddelod Irish in Dufferin Conwy. It's difficult to say how much true northern influence there was, but the echoes in the, the lines of Agadothan, the, the famous poem, are imitated by the writings in this kingdom. Who knew Agadothan? And I can't. They're clearly familiar with the poetry of the North. This is a North facing, North Britain looking dynasty, which is very different to those in the South and those to the Northeast will go to now. Locating how or where the kingdom of Powys even emerges is murky and cloudy or which dynasty it was. raised a great pillar northwest of Hengoshen in the upper bits of Dufferin Cloyd or in the Berwin and this is called the Pillar of Eliseth. Pillar Eliseth. It is in a beautiful area if you ever get a chance. It's here that when Mercia expanded there was just a, an enclave of powers left. A small bit and a brave young king Eliseth led what appears to be a guerrilla resistance re-solidifies his kingdom on just this small bit that's not been conquered, the last of their kingdom. And then he pushes Mercia back and retakes a good chunk of the kingdom. And 
Taoist manages to survive the expansion of Mercia just. And it's after this that Mercia has to build Ofa's dike to stop us. We have records of us trying to defend Chester from Northumbria in 616. Kadeshing, meaning the sons of Kadesh, the descendants of Kadesh. And this may mean that the dynasty that arose in power to found this great kingdom, that his name actually was Kadesh. It appears so. That he was some kind of slave, actually, according to the legend, and that he was blessed. And was given this kingdom, which he expanded. One of the sons who fought at this battle in Chester was Kunan. And he's praised in poems by Taliesin. And some of the poetry we have regarding this kingdom is some of the most stunning I have read in any language, from any time, anywhere. It's heroic, epic poetry, heroic, dark age poetry. Just these poems appear to be a later dynasty, which I'll get to another video. And these poems talk of us in these very specific places in England, these toponyms, these place names that are showing that we have a kingdom administered with different locations as far east as Karluitgoid, Lichfield. And it's ironic that it traces its founding, this Powys kingdom, to Gorthen the historic villain, which at one point was seen as a hero, but as centuries progressed, was seen as a villain. And so you see a change of their story. They tried to shift it, descend it from these people who were blessed by these saints. The idea of who we were and our relation to what happened before with Gorthern and the coming of the Saxons, which he invited them in as mercenaries. It changes over time, and the dynasties in Wales have to then, to keep their rule, they have to change how they perceive themselves to allow others to perceive them as rightful to rule. And in Powys, we see that very distinctly happen. But it's Powys above all that I feel captures the most poignant feeling of the time. It was the most interactive with Saxon politics on the other side of the border, sometimes hostile, sometimes friendly, often both, involved in their wars, trying to maneuver to protect itself, often from them. It makes this dynasty very tough and aware of it being surrounded by land, which again is very different to the others. And it's this region that gives us this poetry, the most poignant, I think, maybe in the history of our language. And here's just one bit from that. Stavach <laughs> Heb dan heb welly. We laugh wares, tow off weddy. Describes all those who have died in the loss of community and family and Canada, nation, kinfolk. And this poetry has images of Heleth, the woman looking over the landscape because where power survives is upland and you can see to the east and always be aware that we lost that land. That's our land and we've lost it. That makes Powys so culturally distinct from the others very early on. At the end of this period, by the 8th century, we begin to call ourselves Khmer, fellow countrymen. We're aware of what's happened, of what's been lost, of who we are. And in the next video, I want to talk a bit about what these four polities, who we are, what we had in common with each other. We've looked at what's distinct between these four regions, but what was the same? If you've made it this far, please consider joining me on Patreon on the screen now. Thank you very much to each and every one of you who do contribute. Thank you very much for watching.